Good morning. Welcome to Williston Presbyterian Church on this beautiful, cool, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> that was ugly. This beautiful South Carolina day. Good to have you with us. Do take note of all the announcements in our bulletin. I do say, Dick, you have a birthday today, don't you? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Well, I'm close. <laughs> Happy birthday. Happy 50th. Yeah, right. <laughs> What's that? One more to be the big nine. Big nine. Well, I know you'll get there. All right. Who has our special bulletin today? All right. right. Stand, introduce yourself, give us a prayer. Okay. Carolyn. Okay. okay. Oh, dear Lord, we, we pray you continue to be with Carolyn and bless and keep her as she, on the loss of her um, loved one. Oh, God, and we pray for our country. We pray that we would make wise decisions as the voting season comes uh, near. This we ask in Christ's name, amen. We'll now have our choral call to worship. If you're able, I'd invite you to stand for our call to worship. We ponder your steadfast love, O oh God. Tell the next generation. Come, let us rejoice and worship God.
Amen. As God's people, let us now pray together our prayer of confession because if we're faithful to confess our sins, our God is faithful to forgive us our sins. Let us pray our prayer. O oh, teacher, in Jesus Christ you have shown that even a prophet can be rejected those who think they know best. Just to listen to your word in our midst, let us not be too proud to hear Open our hearts to those we have easily disregard and the voices we readily exclude. All this we pray through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Amen. today. Uh, she probably thought I was going to throw a firecracker at, again <laughs> this year. And I hope you had a safe and a fun 4th of July. Look at all of the hot, hot, hot summer. So we're going to do our bunny money offering, taking up uh, pocket change for local missions. I think everybody is kind of from the area knows what we're doing here, but we use this money in our community, outside of our community for some special, uh, special things that we do in these communities. I want to, uh, I guess, kind of quoting from Stephen Covey, a guy that wrote a, a thing called The Seven Habits of Successful People. And one of his things was, as he said, always begin what you're doing with the end in sight. In other words, it's kind of like don't dig yourself into a hole until you've got a pretty good idea how you're going to dig yourself out of a hole. So with that in mind, I want to kind of start with the ending, and I want you to think about a few points. Um, Short-term pleasures can lead to long-term traps. Think about it. If things come easy and you get comfortable, you're getting trapped into dependency. And when you're not using your skills, you will lose more than your skills. You will use, lose your choices and freedoms. Think about that. Especially our freedom that we celebrated uh, over the, the 4th of July. So with that, I want to tell you a story about a mouse. A mouse was placed on top of a jar, and the jar was filled with grains. And this mouse, he was so happy to find so much food around him that he no longer felt the need to run around and gather his food. Didn't feel like working anymore because he didn't have to. Now, he, he was happy about his life. And after a few days of enjoying the grains and everything, the mouse kind of made his way to the bottom of the jar. Suddenly, the mouse realized that he was trapped and he didn't have anywhere to go. He fully had to depend on somebody putting additional grains into the jar for him to survive. Now, he had no choice in the matter uh, of what he was given to eat. He just had, he was at the mercy of somebody giving him a handout, so to speak. So once again, I want to repeat those uh, lessons from this. Short-term pleasures can lead to long-term traps. If things come easy, and you get comfortable, you're getting trapped into dependency. And when you're not using your skills, you will lose more than your skills. 
You will lose your choices and lose your freedom. Freedom does not come easy, but it can be lost quickly. And nothing comes easy in life. If it comes too easily, maybe it's not worth it. Never curse at your struggles. Sometimes, and most times, they are your blessings in disguise. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for those to coming together today to worship your name. We thank you for the, the freedoms that, that are given us in life. We thank you for your love and grace upon us. Help us to see, to make healthy and wise choices in life. Go with us and lead us and guide us. In your name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. We now come to our time of prayer. I would like the congregation to know that one of our dear members, Andy Lott, he's resting comfortably under hospice, but he is um, in critical condition, and we don't know um, um, the time could come any, any time when he is called home. Uh, Roxanne is uh, um, uh, surrounded by family, as it should be, and, and they're, uh, they're, they're together. She said a, a very telling thing to me when I saw her yesterday. She said, I've been expecting this day. You know, Andy's been sick for quite a while, for a long time. But now the day has come, it doesn't make it any easier. So please keep uh, Roxanne in your prayers and the, and, the, um, and, the, and the family. Anyway, are there any other prayer requests? Yes. She sure has them, and medicine's a wonderful thing today. You know, my wife's a PT, and she works with young children, many of them premature, and, and she says it's, it's, it's amazing how they can bounce back from all those kind of um, issues like that. So uh, um, 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 so glad she's with us, and mom and daughter are safe. Are there any other prayer requests? Okay, let us go to God in prayer. Eternal God, 
we thank you for all who know that they are not alone. Dear Lord, in each of us, there are memories and reminders of an innumerable company whose lives have entered into our life and with whom we have shared the mystery of our earthly journey. So often we think that how our lives have touched one another, how the things we say and the things we do have a rippling effect that grows and grows. We're grateful for those who've touched our lives. We also pray for those who have sometimes disagreed with us, who have misunderstood us, even though some who honestly have called us to account and we realize that in some ways they knew us better than we knew ourselves. We're grateful for their honesty and we pray that as we go through life that we would listen to what others say and appropriate it with wisdom. Therefore, O oh God, as we seek you, who art the loving Father of us all, we seek that blessing which shall be a blessing for us all. O oh God, you know the secret circle within the intimate walls of each of our hearts. All of those whom you have bound together with us in this bundle of life, whether they be friends or foe, fellow peer, schoolmate, or workmate. Oh, dear Lord, more than that, though, we also lift before you, your throne of grace, all those on our prayer list who are in special need of your care and love. We're grateful for the birth of for Mila and be with her doctors as they uh, treat her. Oh God, we pray for all new parents. Give them wisdom and may they know that as they go into that wonderful stage of life that they are not alone. Oh God, Renew a right spirit in us, we pray, that seeking the vision of your kingdom, we may understand just how inextricably we are interwoven with our lives together, our hopes and our fears, with all other people who struggle in the same web of mortal anguish and seeks to reach seek to reach a peace that only you can give us. Help us to always seek that peace with you, O God, and with one another. This we pray in Jesus' name. And remember the prayer he taught us when he prayed. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture text today is the sixth chapter of Mark's Gospel the first through the 13th verses. It usually comes up once every three years in the lectionary. It's always been a bit of a frustrating passage in that it's basically two different, what we would call pericopes or two different sections. And so you're sort of forced to choose whether to preach on the first half of the passage or the second half of the passage. Well, I've taken a challenge this week. I'm gonna preach on both halves of the passage and try to keep it under an hour and a half. 
So you got your clocks out, you know. <laughs> you can time me, okay? Okay, just don't judge it. You know, I once preached a sermon um, in Ohio, and some of the, my youth in the front, you know, it was um, back in the days in the Olympics, which are coming up, the Winter Olympics, you know, when they put the scores, they held the scores up. And after the sermon over, my uh, high school youth held up scores. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> but before we turn to the text and the sermon, let's turn to God in prayer. Eternal God, we pray your spirit would descend upon this place with power and that your word would be delivered with full assurance through the Holy Spirit and in the strong name of Jesus Christ we ask it. Amen. As I say, our text comes from the sixth chapter of Mark's gospel, beginning with the first verse and ending with the 13th. Uh, I take this from the new revised standard version of the scripture. Let us now reverently attend to the reading of God's holy word. Jesus left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter? the son of Mary and the brother of James and jo Joseph and Judas and Sim Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without, are not without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could not do a deed of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and do not put on tunics. He said to them, Wherever you enter a house, stay there until you have the place, and stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent, and they cast out many demons and anointed with many oil who were sick and cured. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I always find the first half of our gospel reading today about Jesus uh, going to the synagogue and teaching in his hometown, uh, sort of an interesting passage. Uh, number one, uh, it, it claims there that he couldn't do much, yet it says he cured people <laughs> as he touched them. You know, that always, that always stuck out to me. Um, I was thinking about that, how hard it is to come back to your hometown. If you've ever been away for a while, if, if, if you've lived in one place for a long time, this, well, you may not understand this, but I think you'll even, I think you will too. You know, one of the things I've always been afraid to do is I don't like reunions, high school reunions. Are any of you like that with me or do you all just love going to those things? They're shaking their heads. You know, and the reason why I'm so hesitant to go to a high school reunion is that, darn it, my hometown folks remember stuff about me. <laughs> Especially when I was in college that I don't want them to remember. And I'm scared to death that if I go to a high school reunion or a college reunion or any reunion from those days, that they will not see me for who I am now or what I've become, that they'll see me strictly for who I was. And isn't that sort of the thing about a reunion, you know? You sort of have to travel back, you know? I try to fit back in your cheerleader uniform or whatever, whatever you're doing. But it, it goes 
deeper than that because I'm guilty of that. When I was a student at seminary, well, I saw someone who I always, well, we didn't like each other. I may have told you this story before, I don't know. Randy Conley and I, since the beginning of junior high, when I came from the Blue School Elementary School, and he came from Fritch, and we met in junior high, we couldn't stand each other. Something about us rubbed each other the wrong way. And I don't want to go into specifics, but it wasn't just, it was really clear that we, well, physically, <laughs> take that where you want, and verbally did not like each other. So I'm back after my second sem year in seminary, and I'm home in my hometown, Carson City, Nevada, and my mom sends me to the Safeway to get some things. Of course, off I go, and there in the vegetable department was Randy Conley. And as soon as I saw him, it all came back. I gritted my teeth. The hair, if I, you know, I had hair then. <laughs> my hair began to stand on its end, and I was ready for battle. Because in my eyes, he was the same Randy Conley I knew in high school and middle school. When I saw him, that's what I saw. And I walk up to him with my fist clenched, and he looks at me, and he smiles, and he says, Doug, it's nice to see you. I understand you're going to the ministry, and I just want to tell you that I gave my life to Christ three years ago, and that you're a person I pray for. <laughs> Can you imagine my deflation? I was the minister who's supposed to be merciful to him. And he was. The whole problem with that crowd with Jesus, it's so human. You know, we always, when we read this in the Bible, we read about these, how, how dare they not recognize Jesus? How dare they act that way? That's Jesus. How could they do that? Well, it's a very human thing, isn't it? They didn't know everything about Jesus. See, we got the hindsight of the gospel. We know the whole story. Right? Did they know the whole story? They looked at him and said, they looked and they saw just who he was just a short time ago, and they said, how dare he act like that? I guess my point to you, that's a very human kind of thinking, human response, isn't it? Something we all probably much do. Isn't it true that we all tend sometimes to just judge a book by its cover? And we forget that people change and that people grow and that folks are not so simple, complicated. And just as that crowd, that hometown crowd, refused to see Jesus, who he was, let that be a reminder for us not to judge a book by its cover, not to be that way, to realize that folks change, to realize that God can work on people, even people you don't like, and to always hope that people can see the change in you and not judge you just by your cover. So I'm glad Mark included that story in there, and it makes sense to me what happened with them. Uh, hopefully as time went on, I don't know the end of the story, I don't know what happened to the folks in Nazareth by the time Jesus was crucified and rose from the dead. I don't know how many of the hometown folks eventually became church folks, but I bet it was more than you imagine. So, uh, that teaches me. Well, Jesus doesn't let that bother him. He just goes right on, just goes right on preaching and teaching and goes out into the towns. And we have our next passage. See how I'm bringing the two passages together? 
He goes out and he decides to send them out two by two and gave specific instructions. Uh, you know, sometimes you like to take biblical texts and we like to make them complicated. You know, I tend to do that. I, I, you know, to, to, I'm going to go deep <laughs> in this one. You know, and then I realize too often when I go deep, it means I'm going to confuse them. So this is a passage I don't think we have to go terribly deep. You know, I'm, I've always been grateful, you know, as someone who always tries to be someone who likes to read big, thick books. And I came across one time Robert Fulcrum, you know, and he talked about what you learn when you're in kindergarten. You remember those things? What you learn in kindergarten? Number one, be kind. Share everything. When you're finished with something, put your things away. Make sure you take a nap every day. I hated that one until five years ago. <laughs> and if you go out in the world, watch for cars, look both ways, and hold hands. Everything I needed to know in life, I learned in kindergarten. Well, <laughs> that hit me. You know, he's right. You know, like, I think Jesus, maybe if I might borrow some logic from Robert, is teaching us a couple things here in this passage about sending the disciples out two by two, just like he taught us about how we should not judge a book by its cover. The first is, we Christians should not try to be alone. He didn't send them out individually, did he? He sent them out two by two. Uh, the first thing Jesus does in his ministry is to create a community for himself. He doesn't think, okay, I'm going to loan it through these next three years, and, you know, I'm popular enough, I'm, 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 I'm Jesus, I'm going to be able to reach all these crowds by myself. I don't need any help. I don't need anybody, you know, I can do it all on my own. You don't think Jesus could have gone that way if he wanted to? No. He goes and he seeks out companionship. He creates a community. You're not by yourself. Jesus doesn't want any, want any, if I might borrow a term, doesn't want any Lone Ranger Christians out there. We human beings are meant to be in a community together. You know, so much of our culture today is counter that. We have enough stuff with our computers today, you never have to leave the house. You can now call the grocery store and they'll deliver your stuff to you and you don't even have to look at them. They'll put it on the front porch and you can build for it. You don't have to go Amazon. <laughs> By the way, I like Amazon, don't get me wrong. But the truth of it is, you can do all your, everything you used to do at, that, uh, this is going to age me, at Sears or Montgomery Wards or, or uh, Belk or anything like that, you can just go, any kind of shoe, any kind of clothes, anything you need, Home Depot, Lowe's, you don't have to go to that anymore. You don't have to be with those people who may have something to, you know, give you a cold. You can just stay at home. Don't have to worry about it. And we become rather untrusting. Back in the old days, we used to have front yard neighborhoods. Everybody would go out in the front yards and play, you know? And the parents would be able to be sitting there and they'd watch the kids play in the front yard, climb the trees and stuff like that. And it was a, a neighborhood. Somehow in our culture today, we've lost neighborhoods, haven't we? They don't, no, don't you go outside and play. <laughs> Not by, that's dangerous out there, you know? <laughs> don't do it. We're sort of become loners. And our culture sort of encourages it. Heck, the pandemic 
taught us a lot of that. <laughs> Why should you go to church? You can see Doug Blakey on YouTube. I fill the screen. <laughs> you can see Doug Blakey on YouTube anytime you want. You don't have to go to church. Well, during the pandemic, that may have been a comfort, but I think the church lost something. Because I think too many churches got the idea, well, that's the future. The future is just church by TV. You know, you can just go there, dial into the sermon, and you can watch anything at all. By the way, I like, Bob, I like YouTube. Don't get me wrong. It's good stuff. I, I critique myself sometimes if I'm brave enough. It's okay if you think, Blakey, I don't understand what Blakey was saying there. I encourage you to go to YouTube and re-listen to me. Maybe it even be more confusing to you. I don't know. If you're sick, like my wife has a little bit of a bug today, I know she's going to probably dial into YouTube and, and then tell me how I did, just like my high school students. You know, she's going to hold up a no. Uh, <laughs> there's a purpose for it. Or if you can't make it to church for a physical reason, of course that kind of thing is good. But it doesn't replace being together. Jesus sent them out two by two. You're not supposed to be alone. And if there are people who are homebound, it's the congregation's responsibility to take care of them. And it's not just you two. It's taking care of them. So I hope and pray that as time goes on that the church can be countercultural and say we need to be together. Individualism, individualism may have its place, but not that much of a place. We're in this together. And it's always good as the church not to be a lone ranger Christian, two by two. Jesus also tells us there, as we go out as the church, as members of this community, together, we need to remember that Jesus is the boss. As he says, the authority has been given to me to give to you. The Great Commission, all authority has been given to me. Go ye therefore and teach all people. We need to remember that Jesus Christ is the boss and that we, number one, the positive thing is he's not only our leader, he is the savior of the world. As Paul writes as we go out, I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the salvation to man. We go out and we realize who we represent and who we are talking about. And yes, who we serve proudly. Too often, we want to be the boss. We want to be the boss. You know, Jesus talks about traveling light. For me, if I take that metaphorically is we don't have a backup plan. Our plan's the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that Jesus Christ died for you and God loves you and Christ reigns for you. That's the basic gospel message. God loves you. You're God's child. That is what he gives us authority as our boss and savior to proclaim. And we don't go beyond that as Christians. It's not, oh yeah, that's true, but you also got to believe this way. Yeah, that's true, but you know, you need, to, you need to have this kind of political opinion if you really... So often we like to sort of think, well, you know, I'm going to be in charge of some few things too. In literature, one of my favorite pieces of literature is The Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. And in it, there's a little mini, mini novel called The Great Inquisitor. I don't know if you've heard of it or read it. 
It's a pretty famous piece of literature. But anyway, Jesus in the book, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a fictitious story that Dostoevsky tells. Jesus comes back to Spain during the middle of the Inquisition. And he discovers there, when he gets to Spain, rather than all the priests and the religious leaders greeting him, they throw him in prison. Just like the Pharisees did so many years before. And then the Grand Inquisitor comes and visits Jesus, and he informs Jesus of all the mistakes he made when he was on the earth. He said, you know, all your message was just wrong, and now we're trying to correct it for you. We're trying to make it right. So we're going to put you in prison, and you're going to see just exactly, unless we kill you, just exactly what the right message should have been. How we human beings like to take charge. We are sent out together. And Jesus Christ is our boss. And we don't have any other plan. It's simply the gospel. Third thing. I'm not going to do as many as Robert Fulcrum. Third thing is... Don't be afraid of failure. Jesus is pretty good about that. You know, if you go to a place and they invite you in, that's great. Wonderful. Good for those folks. But if you go to a place where your message is not wanted, where my authority in the earth is not recognized, if you go to a place where they, where they want to just say how wrong you are, well, kindly leave that place and just give them the dust of your feet. Too often we want to be successes. We want to, we want to say, you know, I, I got 35 people to put the dotted line down for Jesus. I got notches in my Bible that I put there. I love the joke. I think I've told you it before, but it's a good one. You'll laugh again. A Methodist pastor, a Baptist pastor, and a Presbyterian pastor were going to have a revival. And they planted everything, and they tried to be real cognizant of everybody's um, denominational beliefs. It was an ecumenical kind of thing. And then they came together to discuss the results at the end of it. And the Baptist fellow spoke up first. He says, it was great. I had eight people in the two-day thing come and, re and, and dedicate their lives to Christ and rededicate their lives to Christ. It was wonderful. What a wonderful thing. Then the Methodist guy spoke up and he said, you know, it may not have been as good as you, uh, but we Methodists did well too. We had, we had four people come forward and, and, and they were in the Methodist church on Sunday. It was a wonderful thing. And then both the Baptist and the Methodist look at the Presbyterian and go, well, what about you? He said, I had the best revival of all. We lost 12 troublemakers. <laughs> Don't be afraid to fail. Because all kidding aside... Our job is not to get results. That's not our job. I've been... So often there's such a, pre a, a, a pressure in the ministry that they judge you by the number of people that you've brought into the church. Like that's the measure of your success. That's baloney. God doesn't call us to make sure that our churches become mega churches. God calls us to proclaim the gospel and not worry about it and to love others and let God take care of the growth and what goes on. A Christian's definition of success a disciple of Christ's definition of success 
is not how many notches you have on your Bible of people you've convinced that you know. The definition of success is have you been faithful? Have you been faithful to God's word in your life? Don't be afraid to fail. Because just like Johnny Appleseed, you know, he was out planting apple trees in what's now US 1 in Ohio. And someone, he was an old man, and someone came up to him, they said, and they said, what are you planting those seeds for? You're never going to send any apples off those, off those trees. And he said, I'm not planting them for me. I'm planting for those who come after me. Who knows if you're faithful, and it may even be years down the road, if you're faithful to a young person and not ashamed of the gospel, if you're faithful to the gospel of Christ and recognize him as your Lord and Savior, if you've demonstrated the importance of community in your life, who knows what seeds can be planted that would take fruit years and years from now? Don't be afraid to fail. Accept it. If you want to take your shoe off and do the dust, <laughs> go ahead. Because our job is not to convince people. Our job is to proclaim what we know and what's in our hearts. We leave the rest to God and the Holy Spirit. Don't take their jobs away from them. Well, the good news about the passage is the disciples did, you know, often the disciples don't do anything they're told. Jesus has to get really mad at them all the time. He says, you know, having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? Are you blind? Don't you know what I'm saying? Well, we can be thankful because we're stumbling, bumbling disciples too, if you want to get, if you want to get down to it. We make our share of mistakes. This is a time, praise God, at the end of this passage, it actually worked. They made a difference. They changed lives. And maybe that's a good place to end it, even though I was going to preach an hour and a half. <laughs> maybe this is the good place to end it. Despite the fact that we're stumbling, bumbling, imperfect people, if we remember who's the boss, if we're part of a community that loves and prays and shares together, and go out two by two, and if we are faithful, even in the midst of rejection, who knows, who knows what good you'll be able to do in a person's life and what I've been able to do in a person's life. Because in the end, what this passage teaches me is it's all about Jesus. God is using us as his instruments. So dear friends, don't judge a book by its cover. Always seek to believe the best about others, even if you don't like them. Realize people change and accept that. And as a disciple of Christ, be a part of a church. Don't isolate yourself. And if you have stuff, folks in our midst who are isolated, unisolate them and visit them and be with them. And don't be ashamed of the gospel. Remember, authority has been given to you by the Savior of the world. And don't worry about your results because we serve a great God. He brings the results. Amen. <laughs> Let us now rise and reaffirm what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Will the ushers please come forward. Let us pray. Gracious God, we're thankful that we have the opportunity to give, to express gratitude, to show kindness and love. 
and to support worthy ministries that help proclaim you. Bless now these gifts given in your name. Amen. You know, dear friends, I've had a lot of questions throughout my ministry, and I have to share with you, the ones I fear the most are not from uh, professors or anything like that. The ones I fear the most are from kids. And one day, a junior high kid asked me, Reverend Blakey, do you ever listen to what you preach? <laughs> I was, not, you know, I was on polls. Well, I've got to share with you today, I have not been to my high school graduation ever. And the 50th is coming up in a couple years. And I may just go, <laughs> not ashamed of who I am. And they can think of me what they will. And now, may the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your backs. May the sun shine warm upon your faces and the rains fall softly upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you. May God hold you in the hollow of his hands. God bless you and amen.